Thank you all for joining us. I'm Ian Hunter. I'm the commercial director with Yumi, and I'm delighted to be your host today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Yumi is a university-based connections app which helps students to make friends and stay connected at university. Um, the very large number of you who signed up to this from all over the world um, uh, demonstrates just how important the subject of, of loneliness in our universities is. In fact, in research commissioned by the UK government, they found that while loneliness is experienced by almost all students, over 90%, nearly half don't reach out for help you know, for fear that they would be judged if they admitted to being loneliness. So loneliness is affecting everyone. We've seen this affect students' experience of university, overall wellness, and can lead to mental health challenges, and in many cases, them leaving university in their first year. We hope to encourage more conversations around this topic and what can be done for the students of today. We hope that you will gain some valuable insight into the research around student loneliness and isolation and learn some helpful tips and tricks that you can adopt and implement for your own students at each of your own institutions. The agenda is quite a straightforward one. Um, the purpose of, of, of this is for me to talk as little as possible and for you to hear from, from our experts. We have a keynote address uh, from now until um, 9.05. Uh, which will include some time for Q&A. So if you do have any questions as we go on, um, please put them in the um, Q&A uh, area, um, which should be on your menu bar. Um, um, can I also ask that um, everybody uh, is muted uh, throughout, you should all be anyway, but throughout, if we come to you to ask a quest for a question, then you, you will be free to unmute yourself. Um, so at 9.05, we'll um, have a 10 minute break for you all to stretch your legs and get some refreshments uh, before returning at 9.15 for our panel discussion. We've got four excellent panelists who we'll introduce you to a little later. First though, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of the day, who is Michael Priestley. He's a research associate from the psychology department at King's College London. Um, and he has been conducting national research on student isolation alongside Nicola Byram, who's the founder of Student Minds. So I'm going to stop sharing now as, with our first technical challenge and um, hope that Michael can seamlessly take over. Perfect. Can I just double check that you can see that on screen? Brilliant. OK, well, firstly, thank you so much for having me uh, this morning. Um, so as Ian says, my name's uh, Michael Priestley. I'm a researcher at King's and I'm working on the You Belong project, which is a three year project trying to understand more about social connection, loneliness and belonging among university students. And I thought just to kick us off today, I'd give a kind of very brief overview of some of uh, the existing evidence base around loneliness among university students, what we know, what we don't know, and some of the early findings from the You Belong project. So um, to help us understand how to combat student loneliness, uh, I thought it might be helpful to, to think together about what loneliness is. Um, so loneliness is often kind of uh, understood or conceptualized as being distinct from social isolation. So social isolation might be the absence or lack of having social relationships or a social network. Whereas loneliness is often um, conceptualized as a negative emotional state that arises from a per perceived discrepancy between the social relationships that one wants to have and then the social relationships that they actually have. And that could be either in terms of the quality or quantity of those relationships. So for example, um, you might want to have loads of really close friends, not have those in practice, and um, as a result, end up feeling lonely. Now this is helpful because this um, allows us to understand that loneliness is not just the same as being alone. Um, for, for many of us, being alone can be a positive and, and restorative um, experience. Um, and, if, and if we think about uh, if, if you kind of were quite happy or, or wanted few social relationships and then had quite a few social relationships, um, you could spend a lot of time alone without necessarily feeling lonely. You'll have to forgive me for the timer on the screen, uh, on the slide. Sorry about that. Um, at the same time, loneliness can and often does occur in the presence of others. 
um, and often involves kind of a, a deeper sense of, of disconnection or dissatisfaction with the relationships that we have. So a lot of researchers have tried to kind of capture this distinction by differentiating between social loneliness and emotional loneliness. So social loneliness is often thought of as this absence of kind of uh, people or relationships or, or, or people to spend time with. Emotional loneliness um, might be different in terms of you, you perhaps have lots of people to spend time with, but you lack those people that you can, um, that provide kind of supporting, trusting relationships. Loneliness is not one thing, it'll be experienced differently for everybody um, and has tended to be kind of thought of as, as involving kind of effective cognitive and behavioural features. Um, so in other words, kind of the effective or the emotional features of loneliness might involve things like um, feeling depressed, hopeless, frustrated, angry. Um, the cognitive features of loneliness uh, are related to the selective kind of retention or interpretation of social information. So a lot of people that experience loneliness often describe kind of perceiving that others around them are kind of hostile to them or judging them or laughing at them um, and kind of interpret the, the, their social environment through that lens. And then the behavioural features of loneliness often include kind of social um, withdrawal or isolation. Um, and a lot of kind of qualitative evidence shows us that paradoxically, students that report feeling really lonely want to make friends and connect with other people around them, but at the same time kind of engage in activities like isolating themselves or removing themselves from um, their, their peers. Um, this is because of this kind of cognitive aspect of loneliness, where it kind of uh, feeling lonely heightens the perception of kind of vigilance or threat in the social environment uh, and to avoid the kind of the emotional um, characteristics of loneliness so that feeling down and depressed. Um, people that are lonely can often then remove themselves from social encounters where they feel risk of doing that and I think this can be really helpful in terms of kind of understanding the experience of loneliness um, in a university setting that often um, students that are feeling kind of most lonely will be the ones that don't go and engage or take part in any of the social activities that university has to offer. And that's because of some of the kind of cognitive or behavioural features um, of loneliness that might prevent that or cause that to be a difficulty. And often those students require kind of additional levels of, of support or guidance in terms to connect and make and make friends. Um, loneliness itself is kind of a common experience often will be kind of transient or temporary and in many cases is, is adaptive. So there's lots of evidence kind of from a, an evolutionary perspective of loneliness that because social relationships bring us all kinds of access to resources and emotional support, the feeling of loneliness is kind of a warning sign that we are isolated and lacking in those resources and kind of prompts us or promotes us to go and reconnect with, with people around us. It becomes a problem when it becomes more chronic and long term um, and can have kind of maladaptive consequences uh, like those that Ian mentioned at the start. So how common is loneliness among students? Um, it's been estimated that around one in four students in the UK report feeling lonely most or all of the time. Uh, and emotional loneliness tends to be more common among university students than social loneliness. So this suggests to us that perhaps in a university setting, it's not so much that students don't have the opportunity to connect with uh, peers and people around them, but they might not be able to form the kind of um, close emotional uh, relationships or ties with people with things in common in the way that they want. Evidence suggests that compared to the general population, students are twice as likely to report um, loneliness. What remains unclear is whether this is uh, specifically a university phenomenon or whether this is kind of related to age and um, development. As we know that um, the peak age for the onset of loneliness is, is what psychologists might might refer to as emerging adulthood, which is kind of this 18 to 25 year old period when there's an increased kind of psychological or, or cultural importance placed on, on having kind of stable relationships with, with people around us. And this also coincides with the time that lots of people enter into university. So it's unclear whether loneliness is kind of a developmental issue or a specifically university issue. But what we do know is that current generations of students tend to be lonelier than previous generations. So the authors that you can see on screen, they conducted a big systematic review and analysis of studies going right back to the 1970s to the present day, looking at 
um, studies that had used consistent measures of loneliness and found an increase in loneliness among young people. And this trend is predicted to continue. And that's because um, the evidence again suggests to us that um, extended periods of isolation or loneliness in childhood uh, predict uh, loneliness then later on in kind of adolescence and, and early adulthood. Um, and, and we know that there's a there's a whole kind of cohort or generation of young people that due to the COVID-19 pandemic experience kind of additional social challenges, additional extended periods of isolation and loneliness um, that then may have kind of consequences for when they come to enter into the university. So why is loneliness a problem? Well, as Ian mentioned, loneliness is strongly associated with kind of mental health challenges among students, such as depression, anxiety, etc. Um, it's also associated with significant physical health challenges. Um, so some authors have estimate have kind of predicted that the, the impact of loneliness on our kind of physical health is the equivalent to kind of smoking cigarettes daily or, or obesity or other kind of common um, physical health risks. And we also know that loneliness is associated with kind of academic challenges, including dropout. Um, and these academic challenges can kind of persist throughout the university journey and into the wider workplace. So again, lots of evidence shows that kind of longitudinally over time, um, loneliness is associated with kind of lower um, social and uh, financial kind of predictors of quality of life in later in kind of later adulthood. So what? are the causes of loneliness. Um, there's no kind of single cause of loneliness. Often it might be helpful to think of these more as kind of risk factors that interact or increase the risk of students experiencing loneliness whilst at university. And in many cases, some of these kind of um, risk factors are bi-directional and cyclical. So if we look at the second one, for example, uh, mental and or physical illness, um, mental and physical illness increases the risk of loneliness. Loneliness often exacerbates mental and physical illness and then increases the risk of loneliness and it becomes a cyclical um, pattern. Um, but the notwithstanding kind of the complexity of, of loneliness and how this will be experienced differently for the different individuals, the, relation, uh, the evidence does suggest that there are kind of certain factors that do uh, increase the risk of loneliness among university students. Um, so most notably kind of transition, uh, whether that's geographical relocation um, or uh, starting a university um, is a kind of a, a key risk period for loneliness, as is kind of insecure identities or uncertainty about the future. There's also evidence to suggest that kind of the loss of a significant um, emotionally supportive relationship can have significant implications for, for loneliness, whether that's through the, the breakup of an existing relationship or through bereavement. Evidence also suggests that kind of um, physical conditions that prevent uh, students from actually meeting and spending time with other people can also significantly increase the loneliness, that the, the risk of loneliness. So that might be things like living alone. It might be kind of academic or financial demands that make it difficult to, to interact with peers. Um, it might be through kind of exclusion or, or discrimination where existing kind of relationships break down and that increases the risk of loneliness. And then the literature around social media is quite conflicted and, and nuanced. Um, what it seems to suggest is that um, for like for many people, uh, social media can be kind of an important strategy in terms of preventing or addressing loneliness. Uh, where it can become a problem is where people engage in social media in a really passive way. So they might just be kind of scrolling through their feed, absorbing other people's social experiences, but not using it to kind of interact or engage or kind of maintain or form relationships. So which students are the most at risk of loneliness? Well, we know that the prevalence of loneliness is not equally experienced across the student community. And Barreto and colleagues um, recently published a, a really good paper in which they encouraged us to see loneliness as a social justice issue. Um, so they argue that kind of traditionally across research and practice, there's a tendency to kind of think of loneliness as an individual problem, as something kind of related to the individual personality or perhaps psychology in which they are kind of unable to connect and make friends. And they actually kind of uh, present the evidence to show us that a lot of those risk factors that we looked at for loneliness are kind of structurally or, or systematically embedded, which means that certain kind of cohorts of students are going to be at increased risk of experiencing loneliness. Um, so the cohorts, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the student groups that you can see on, on 
screen, um, evidence kind of consistently suggests are at increased risk of kind of social challenges and barriers um, at university, which obviously for many is kind of compounded and exacerbated by um, cumulative intersectional um, challenges across these uh, characteristics. So how can we kind of effectively address uh, loneliness? Uh, unfortunately, the evidence here is quite limited um, and there's kind of no single kind of magic wands that we can wave to address loneliness in our, in our uh, student population. What kind of systematic review and meta-analysis does suggest is that social and emotional skills training, psychological treatment, social support and meditation, mindfulness can all kind of uh, um, positively impact on, on loneliness. Uh, however, within that, the kind of the evidence varies significantly, um, which means that kind of uh, the way in which those things are kind of enacted seems to matter quite a lot. Um, so the kind of the preliminary evidence seems to suggest that where students are more kind of actively engaged in those forms of support, um, that, see, that seems to be kind of more, uh, have, have a stronger positive effect than when it's a, a passive experience. Um, and then lonely individuals have, have described kind of the importance of uh, developing kind of social support networks, um, cognitive regulation and having a routine as a way for them to address loneliness. So that's a lot of the things that we know, but there's a lot of gaps in our understanding of loneliness, um, including kind of whether and how the causes of loneliness differ in among university students and in non-university students, how the kind of predictors or, or causes of loneliness might change over time across the university journey, some of the wider kind of spatial or economic determinants of loneliness, um, and particularly if we, if we think about what we just saw on screen there, um, a, a kind of lack of understanding of perhaps more kind of structural or institutional level changes or interventions that might uh, impact or, or reduce the experience of loneliness. And then the potential increase in loneliness caused by university social events or narratives, particularly during that freshers week. So there tends to be a kind of um, a assumption that uh, everything in, in freshers to kind of promote social connection is inherently good. Um, and, and actually uh, there's potential that, that some of those things might have a harmful effect. So it's against this backdrop that, that you belong uh, kind of exists really and set out to kind of address some of these existing research questions. So um, throughout the you belong, oh sorry, throughout the you belong project, um, we are engaging in social network analysis to kind of analyze students' uh, social networks before university and then when they enter the university to see how changes in those relationships during that transition might predict loneliness. We're conducting survey data at different time points to see how the uh, kind of risk factors for loneliness might change over the university experience and how they might interact and intersect with each other at different points across the university journey. We're conducting interviews with students using photos in which we're really trying to understand how loneliness might be articulated and understood in relation to the specific university uh, environment, including some of the kind of spatial and, and cultural features of the university. And we've done quite a lot of work around trying to understand social expectations and the role that they might play uh, in predicting loneliness among um, university students, um, which I'll go on to say a little bit more about in a second. So we're in the very early stages of You Belong, but some of our kind of initial findings suggest that the students that are most at risk of loneliness kind of uh, corresponds to what we found in, in previous evidence. So students with a diagnosed mental health condition and students that identify as being part of the LGBTQ plus community or having a fluid non-binary gen non gender identity seem to be at significantly increased risk of loneliness um, at university. Um, through our kind of interviews, uh, we've just finished conducting interviews and, and some of the kind of emergent findings so far seem to suggest the importance of uh, turning points, which is a, a phrase that we've borrowed from kind of other authors, um, which really emphasise the importance of kind of particular episodes or activities early on in the university journey that can then have significant implications for uh, whether the student will go on to experience loneliness. And this can be both positive and negative. So students describe kind of maybe in the first week having like a really positive social experience uh, with, with somebody that then leads to um, developing kind of social networks and can lead to uh, an enriched social experience of university. 
at the same time, kind of particular episodes that seem to represent for an individual kind of being isolated or being excluded can then become cyclical. And it can kind of really shape the way in which students perceive the university and the way in which they go around about making friends. One of the really uh, other striking things from um, conducting these interviews with students is the prominence um, still of this kind of alcohol cultural narrative around alcohol as being kind of the only way of making friends at university and a perception that kind of you have to drink alcohol um, in order to make friends. So potentially there's, there's still some, some work to do uh, for universities in terms of trying to address and challenge that narrative around the, um, the, the kind of importance of, of alcohol culture. Um, another kind of uh, striking finding is the awareness and resistance of, of macro social narratives. And, and one kind of example of this would be particularly in relation to social media. So a lot of students were kind of are aware of this kind of wider narrative in society that social media is kind of all bad and causes loneliness and is the root of all evil. Um, and a lot of students are kind of quite re were quite resistant to that and actually saying that social media or, or kind of digital forms of, of communication have been really, um, really important in terms of kind of making and maintaining friends when they first went into university. At the same time, alongside this space and place is really important to the experience of university. So it seems like the kind of the digital medium of making of making friends is effective when it then leads to relationships or activities that take place in the real world um, uh, and kind of making and maintaining relationships that exist in real life and it can it's it's ineffective or um, where, where students kind of feel isolated or or locked out of those spaces um, it can be ineffective and I think the other thing is just the real importance of the academic sphere both in terms of kind of making friends but also being a key site in which students can feel kind of isolated and excluded so lots of students talked about how they made most of their friends on the academic course and that this was really positive but for students that are feeling lonely often the kind of the experience in the academic space is one in which they, that those kind of feelings of isolation and exclusion are really compounded and then, as I mentioned, we've done quite a lot of work to try and understand what students expect university social life to be like. And this is because if we go back to thinking about what loneliness is as being kind of a discrepancy between the social relationships that we want to have and the social relationships that we that we do have, um, it might play a really important role in terms of understanding kind of why students might be at increased risk of loneliness. And one of the really kind of striking things that we found, so we've done a, a kind of review or, or overview of the um, of marketing materials from, from university services and there tends to be a kind of uh, representation of of the social experiences being really positive um, straightforward uh, really easy to make friends and a lot of students are kind of describing how kind of coming from school lots of friends kind of form kind of quite naturally or organically just from being in the same place with people sharing time with people doing the same classes with people and there's a real kind of underestimation for, for new students coming into university about how much kind of active effort and responsibility is required in making and maintaining friends um, and that actually friends are they're difficult to form just by being in the same place because lots of people aren't necessarily in the same places and spaces and doing the same routine um, and one of the things that we found is, is a big discrepancy between what students kind of expect in terms of the number or type of friendships that they might have at university and then their subsequent experience when they arrive at university seems to be a really significant predictor of loneliness itself. And again, this intersects with, with kind of what, when we were talking about what loneliness is. Um, many students might in, in their experience of university have quite a small social network, but if that's what they expected and wanted, that might, that might not be kind of a predictor of loneliness itself. Um, so the, the role of expectations can be really important. Um, so taken all together, given the kind of the wide variety of factors that, that um, the impact on loneliness, um, what's becoming clear is that the need for a kind of whole institutional approach to loneliness that will involve kind of different factors and interventions kind of across the whole institution uh, as a way of kind of addressing and um, responding to, to loneliness. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really sorry about the, um, the timing on the slides that seemed to jump us about a bit, but I hope it was still helpful. Um, and yeah, I welcome any questions. Thanks again.
That's excellent. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, we actually do have a couple of questions that have that have come through already. So if you're happy for me to to ask you them, um, then then I'll then I'll crack on. Um, the first one is: um, Do you have any findings on the effects of engagement with student groups, such as societies and sports clubs, on student loneliness? Um, yes. So the the the. But but we do in terms of some of the work that we've done in New Belong, and the evidence here is 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 fairly conclusive that engagement with with uh, societies and sports clubs is positive in terms of addressing loneliness, increasing the experience of belonging, increasing student mental well being. Some of the challenges that I think we're starting to unpick is that for the really lonely students that would benefit the most from engaging the, with those activities, there's so many different kind of um, either practical or kind of psychological challenges or barriers to engaging in, in those activities. But once we get students to engage with those activities, the evidence is fairly conclusive that that is, um, has a really positive effect um, in terms of combating loneliness. Great, thank you for that. And another one, uh, that was from Max Pike, another one from Steph Doyle. Do you think students are more willing to go from digital to IRL interactions when the events are arranged by the university or when they are student led? So this is difficult, but I think from, from kind of my experience, um, in terms of some of the work that we did around kind of student expectations of forming relationships, uh, I think the role of the university in, in kind of managing, in kind of putting on social events for students to kind of initiate social connections is really important because a lot of students seem to, or were describing to me how they were really kind of unfamiliar or unprepared in terms of that, like that actually kind of making friends. So some of the student led um, kind of social events can be um, can be problematic and can also kind of compound some of these feelings of isolation and exclusion for certain student groups. So uh, I think from some of the work that we've done, uh, some of the qualitative work that we've done, I suggest that the role of the university in terms of kind of structuring and facilitating some of those social connections um, can be, uh, it would be more effective and positive. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Betty Anika. Uh, there seems to be a lot of anxiety around sharing kitchens. Are there any tips to help with shared kitchen anxiety? Uh, that's a great question. That's something that's come up so much in terms of the uh, in terms of the qualitative work that we've done. That when students are talking about kind of negative relationships, um, they tend to always be in in accommodation and, and particularly around kind of shared living standards. I'm not I'm not really sure in terms of like what best practice is to do here. Um, I do wonder whether perhaps in the context of what we've done, that some of the, there could potentially be some work around kind of um, expectations or expectation management of around what living with other people uh, might be like and what kind of um i don't know etiquette for living in a shared space might be like pre-entry into university and kind of supporting some of those conversations perhaps beforehand or when students first arrive um so that it's not kind of left to um lead to kind of tensions or challenges further further down the line fantastic thank you um last last couple um, unless uh, what I would ask if anybody's got any further questions, pop them into the Q&A. Um, uh, in fact, we've just got one as we speak, so I'll go to that one straight away. Um, do you have any advice on organising activities for neurodivergent students? Um, so this probably isn't my area of expertise. Um, I think there is some uh, preliminary kind of findings in this space. Um, I think from what from some of the kind of work that I've looked at and some of the conversations that I've had, um, I think it does seem to be helpful to have kind of um, social events that, kind, that are kind of separated or badged as being distinct and particularly catering for that for that kind of demographic of students. Um, and doing so in a way that perhaps involves kind of more structured ways in terms of initiating those conversations, perhaps with fewer people. So thinking really carefully about what the activities might be. Um, as I say, I think I think there is some uh, evidence in this space, and I would just also really encourage kind of co-production uh, as a way of kind of working with 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 students that are neurodivergent to to kind of understand um, what works for them. Because from a lot of the interviews that I've had. Uh, it's, it's kind of one of those turning points that I describe that they can go to events quite early on, feel like they're not for them. And that can kind of really shape the way that they then kind of perceive and interpret their university journey going forward, that the kind of the social experience isn't really for them. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Um, I would uh, also point out to everybody that Lucy has put a link in the chat channel um, uh, to Michael's uh, research. So there's a there's a URL in the chat if anybody wants to, to have a look at that. Um, one last question before we wrap up this this brilliant session, uh, uh, Michael. Um, how how can this research project be used to inform the HE sector going forward? Do you think? Good question for a small amount of time. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's something that we that we're trying to work with. So um, we're in the process of kind of des designing or thinking about how we can collect. Um, uh, how we could collect kind of the best quality data possible going forward and and I think that some of the kind of longitudinal data that we're collecting over time can be really helpful because that can point us towards some of the things that might happen that are associated with kind of changes in student loneliness kind of across the student experience and might kind of help to see what the kind of some of the points of of intervention or or, or change might be um, so I'm really hoping that as we kind of build on our longitudinal data set, we'll be able to see some kind of intervention points and some of the factors that might be associated with, with reduced uh, loneliness among university students. Um, I'm also hoping that kind of it can really sh shine a light perhaps on some of the um, some of the kind of expectations that universities uh, that, uh, kind of perhaps build around what the social experience is and just kind of changing the narrative slightly uh, to, so that students are arriving with kind of perhaps a more um, realistic expectation of what the university experience will actually be um, and the process of, of, of making friends in that space. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful from kind of like a qualitative perspective that that shift in understanding can really inform some of our practice as well. Fantastic. I'm, I am going to extend just by as we tick on to 905 because um, we've had a, a couple of uh, well, a, a question and a, an offer uh, from James Rumble. Um, the first of which is the question which gives me a, a chance that I'm going to ignore to unashamedly pitch Yumi. Um, but are you aware of any approaches unis are taking to combat loneliness? Yeah, so one of one approach is is Yumi, um, which which as Ian said at the start is kind of a, a, an app to facilitate students to kind of um, form some of those connections with with students that might have shared interests or things in common with them in a digital space, to then lead to to kind of um, uh, yeah, le leading to some of those in in, in person friendships and and relationships. Um, I think some of the really good work in this space and. Um, the perhaps a, a good way a good place to start might be the education for mental health toolkit that was produced by advanced he I, I think a lot of the good practice emerging in this space that i've seen is is when social interventions are embedded in the curriculum um, and kind of building ways in which um, students through their course can build relationships and interact with other people whether that's through kind of collaborative or or group-based learning or things like that because given some of the challenges that we said that lonely students might experience to going along to kind of society events or things, the course is where they are engaging in. And, and I think it's, uh, that is kind of there's, there's some emerging good practice around um, looking particularly around how we can we can support students to, to build relationships in that space. As I say, as a first point of call, I'd recommend the uh, the Advanced HE Education for Mental Health Toolkit. And I'm pretty sure they have a chapter looking particularly around social integration and belonging um, within the curriculum. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, James's other point was that they have a neurodivergent wellbeing group at, at their institution, um, and he's happy to share in full. Um, um, and hopefully he's going to be able to share that to everyone uh, later on. So thank you for that. Perfect. Thank brilliant. you so much, Michael. That was brilliant. We've almost kept a time and we didn't because of Matt, because of me. Um, so thanks very much for that. I'm, I'm sure I echo everyone um, in saying uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation. And thank you very much for everybody else's benefit. We're going to break now um, um, until 9.15 when we'll start again with the panel and um, and again, just thank you, Michael, and look forward to seeing you all at um, quarter past nine, all refreshed and rehydrated. Thank you very much. So welcome back. I hope um, everyone found Michael's presentation as interesting and thought provoking um, as I did. Uh, the interaction with questions would, would seem to indicate that that was the case. Um, and, and now I'm really excited to start the second half off with, um, with our panel discussion. Um, I'm going to ask each of our, our panelists to introduce themselves, um, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a moment. 
um, when I've actually moved forward the slides. I'm waiting for a thumbs up from Misha to say that we have the new slide up. Perfect, it's working too well so far. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce our ask our panelists to introduce themselves, um, starting off with Kate, if I may. Can I just also make sure that you're all unmuted for this, this session? Otherwise, it's not going to be much of a panel discussion. Thanks, Ian. Am I OK to go ahead? You're good to go ahead. Hi there, I'm Kate Aitchison. I'm head of the Student Health and Wellbeing Services at Newcastle University. Um, so that means I oversee a number of the services that we provide here for students. That includes counselling, disability, um, chaplaincy, our operations team, uh, wellbeing consultancy service, and some school-based wellbeing advisors. So I've got a, a fairly broad remit um, and student loneliness can kind of come into to all of that really. Um, we are now into our second year um, of using UMI. Um, so we've got some, hopefully, a basis of some really interesting discussion about how UMI can, can work and fit into this picture as well. Um, we, I would say that although Student Health and Wellbeing brought UMI into um, to the university to look at, at loneliness and belonging, it, it is, as, as we've heard already, such a university-wide um, issue. So more recently, and I think it's been really, really effective to do it this way, we have been partnering with our kind of student life team and student reps um, to, to really try and push that forward. And I think obviously we can see that in the um, other, other guest panel uh, members that we have today. So hopefully we're in for a really interesting discussion. And thanks very much for having me. Brilliant. Thanks, Kate. Misha. Hi, I'm uh, Misha Rose, Head of Student Experience at the University of Kent. Um, I, as part of my role in my remit, I have both strategic and operational uh, responsibility for everything student experience. So as you can imagine, that's quite a broad remit. Um, my teams uh, look after such things as student voice, um, communications, uh, we look after events and anything uh, around kind of building community and, uh, and building kind of having that sense of belonging on campus sits, sits well within our remit. Um, Kent has been with UMI for two years, but um, actually only university wide for one year. Um, so we, we only had UMI originally in one of our, our fac or faculties or divisions, as we call them. Um, and then we decided to go university wide with it in September, just to add another mechanism of, of uh, building connections uh, between students, um, both before, well, whilst they join university. Uh, and it's been a huge success. Uh, and it's, it's part of our kind of arsenal, if you like, of, of building that community and, and, and building and, and enhancing and creating that, that uh, very core and transformative uh, experience that, that we try to, to do at Kent. So, yeah, I look forward to being part of this panel. Fantastic. Thanks, Misha. Jenny. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, Sorry, my internet went quick there. Um, I'm Jenny Day. I'm the Head of Student Engagement at Essex Students Union. Um, my, my sort of remit's very broad, very much looking after our communities at Essex on campus, our student community officers, but also our whole event programme and engagement programme as well. Um, I joined six months before the pandemic, so my job very drastically changed when I was responsible for engagement and events uh, during a pandemic when the world very much sort of shut down. Um, so a really key aspect of that was that we partnered with UMI in early 2021 and um, initially we partnered with UMI as a trial and um, we did a massive campaign across campus called Let's Connect where we did many events online for Students Connect but launched UMI at the same time. Only within that two week period we had over a thousand students join UMI because they really needed that connection at the time. Um, currently, my remit is still very broad in the sense of making sure we put on a range of activities for all our students. So that ranged from small sessions for students to meet friends and um, to larger scale events like our SU Makes programs, that's arts and craft and make friends, to then massive mass, mass participation events during Welcome and also our fireworks as well. So really keen to be on this panel and learn from the others as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Jenny. And Emily? Hi everyone, hi. Um, so I work at the University of Sheffield 
um, and I'm a wellbeing advisor. Um, I, al I also do another role where I work with a team called SEDI. So today I'm kind of coming from two um, positions, if you like. Um, but just in terms of the wellbeing service, this is um, university wellbeing one-to-ones for students. Um, we have we launched in 2020 during the pandemic. Um, it wasn't because of the pandemic, it just kind of fell that the service started in March 2020 and we went straight into remote offer. Um, but now we're currently face-to-face -face and online and telephone. Um, and we focus uh, on one-to-ones with students where we take a real holistic view um, on their, the issues that they present with. So essentially, whether that can be personal concerns, mental health, academic stress, social isolation, essentially we are having those one-to-ones and open and honest conversations with students and asking them to um, essentially come to those appointments in order for us to make sense of what's going on for them and then offer them any, um, any extra support. And um, we are also, a fac it's also a faculty based offer. So we're very much implemented into our faculties in the university, which is really helpful for staff as well, because it means that staff and faculties have an assigned wellbeing advisor for, for their faculty. Um, and it's a great way of us identifying trends as well. So there might be particular um, cohorts or departments or um, demographics where we're finding things like social isolation is higher in certain areas. Um, we also offer seminars and webinars as well. Um, and we also do group work for students, um, particularly for hard to reach student communities. And SEDI, the other kind of side of my work, um, I'm a team manager um, um, in, uh, in that team. And essentially that's the Student Experience Diversity and Inclusion team. And essentially SEDI is to promote and celebrate diversity in the student community. So our offer is to support student experience and provide activities and events for non-traditional student communities. So some examples of that is we run something called Global Campus, which is an ongoing orientation to all students to help do activities and promote them meeting other students. We have BMBR, which is our belief and non-belief uh, religious life centre where that's chaplains and religious advisors to offer pastoral support. We also have community projects where we work with um, students from non-traditional student backgrounds, um, like care leavers, estranged students, refugees, um, students like that. But essentially with both teams, we are front facing on the ground, working di directly with students. So we have pretty good insights as to different student experiences. Um, I would say today, probably a lot of what I'll be talking about will be more heavily from a wellbeing perspective in the wellbeing team, just because my study role is, is pretty new. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Emily. Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree that's a, that's a, a, great, a, a great panel uh, that, that we've, we've managed to put together. So I'm excited about the, the next 20 minutes or so. The format is we've got kind of four areas that we're gonna, uh, you said holding up five fingers. Uh, we've got four areas uh, that we're gonna focus on. Um, and as long as I remember to move the slides forward and ask the questions correctly, then we should be okay. Um, and so the first the first area um, is around um, the current landscape. I'm going to start with Jenny here because she was the first to mention uh, the COVID uh, experience. But just to get um, from each of you, we've got five minutes for each of these um, the, these four areas. Uh, from each of you, um, how is how is the the landscape of, of engagement and experience changed? over the last couple of years since the pandemic. Uh, Jenny, can I start with you? Yeah, of course. And I very much will talk from the sort of a student's union aspect on this as well. So definitely since COVID, we've seen students coming back and either drinking a lot less than they did or a lot of students just not drinking. Um, so that really has sort of, if we hadn't have changed our program, there's a lot less of those moments or events or those connections are really lost for our students. So everyone just assumes, oh, you could have gone go to the bar or a lot of the events that specifically students unions would hold and we've definitely really noticed that so we've had to act really quickly in the sense of being able to put on events that students feel safe to go to but also feel that there isn't that sort of oh I can't go because actually I'm not drinking sort of event on that and um, we still see every welcome students a lot more nervous than they used to be pre-COVID as well so definitely interested to hear from other unis on that and um, but they're definitely the sort of the key aspect 
aspects of that since. Regarding our communities as well, they I'd say they've got stronger because they need to support each other as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, a reminder to everybody as well that just to pop your questions over any of these subjects into the chat. Uh, we do have a Q&A at the end, sorry, to pop them into the Q&A, we, we have a, uh, some time at the end uh, for any questions. Misha, can I come to you on that on that, um, that COVID question? Yeah, of course. So um, Kent is a, a purely campus based uni um, and the uh, expectation is that students attend everything on campus. So switching to kind of hybrid and online learning during COVID actually had quite a lasting effect for Kent. And we've seen um, on campus engagement drop uh, and probably is still building back up uh, even now when we're what three or four years later uh, after after the kind of end of the, the lock continuous lockdowns as they felt. Um, so we've had to uh, revamp the, the type of um, engagement opportunities that we have, the types of events that we have, looking at kind of shorter, more give it a go sessions that can fit in between um, both student study and also now work, which I don't think that was, was such a big deal before COVID. Um, and as I said, we were, were campus based and, and that meant that a lot of students or the majority of students lived on campus or very close to campus. And we're now finding that they're not um, all living on campus. They're living uh, still with their parents or they're commuting in or we've got a, a different gram a demographic of students at, at Kent now. So we're having to, to think broader than, than we did before um, and think about um, providing different levels of opportunity for, for the different students that can fit in with the the work and life balance, which we probably didn't account for pre-COVID. Okay, okay. Thanks, Misha. Kate? Um, yeah, I guess picking up on, on that would, would say very, very similar in terms of that that blend is, is definitely the expectation now, you know, to be able to come into a lecture, but if not, to, to be able to engage with it online or recap it online. Um, and I think for everything we offer, there is now that expectation that it's going to be that there is a blended offer. And, and there is. Um, I think what's quite interesting is when we think about support, we're definitely finding now that more and more students are wanting their support to be in person, um, particularly for things like counselling. Probably about 80 percent of our students, 80 to 90 even, want in-person appointments and are willing to wait for in-person appointments over um, over remote ones or telephone ones. So uh, I think that we're definitely seeing students want support in person, that kind of relational part in person. Um, but but some of the rest of it, exams, for example, still very much wanting online options, take home options, that sort of thing. Um, I think what Misha alluded to just now is is really, really important. And that's the the landscape that the cost of living crisis is now giving us as well. That's obviously kind of come on the back of COVID um, and I think is feeding in a lot to a very different student experience. So so, yes, students now having to really think about balancing and more students than ever did balancing work. Um, with their studies and with that social life and I think what we're what we're seeing certainly for some students is that it's the social element that has to go you know they, they've got to do their their studies and they've got to do work because of the cost of living crisis um, and I think that's also impacting the people that are coming onto campus so students making decisions about uh, I've only got one lecture today I'm going to save myself the commute I'm going to save myself the travel I'm I'm not going to go in I'm not going to go to that lecture so you know we heard earlier about you know those communities within courses and you know where where people are kind of getting to know each other on their course and I actually think they're spending less time doing that now they're spending less time coming into their courses and and doing things like that um because they're trying to balance and because they're trying to save money so I think that's the that's absolutely massive for our students at the minute especially when it comes to loneliness yeah that's massive isn't it um thanks and and Emily I think um if, if we finish with you on this on this particular uh current landscape piece yeah thank you um I think, like I uh, said in my introduction, our wellbeing service launched in March 2020, so we didn't have a lot of comparison in terms of pre-COVID, in, in terms of engagement. Um, and originally the service was going to be a face-to-face -face offer only. Um, and I think that what COVID did was allow us to be uh, have open 
be open to kind of other avenues of connection that's been really great and I think I personally was worried about it initially due to my background of only doing face-to-face engagements um, in previous roles in the charity sector Um, and what we found is students engage really well with one-to-ones remotely Um, as we came back onto campus that offer then was face-to-face telephone um, video chat and I think that it allows students that have bigger barriers to have those varied options and are able to open up Um, and it might be that a student initially comes for an appointment um, as a telephone and then maybe that grows to a video chat and then eventually that comes to face to face but I think just allowing students to have those options is is really important and I think that is now the student expectation that there is more you know there's lots of different ways of connecting with us um, in in terms of actual engagement our one-to-ones have always been busy we, we you know we're always like fully our appointments always fully booked and some interesting kind of internal data in our mental health services showed that during the pandemic numbers of engagement went up for uh, mental health services but the severity of presentation went down which I think is it is still but apparently this data is still being looked at but I think we can make like an educated guess that perhaps students access services more easily and quickly and they were able to be more proactive rather than reactive when personal issues came uh, were you know came up and didn't become bigger over time so having that accessibility was just really helpful um to students um but from our experience this this student groups that we have um essentially um we found that it allows students to not feel isolated if they come along to groups and we find that for example a student group that we find talks about social isolation quite a lot is our PGR community and we think that due to long periods of like lone working when you're doing research and we've had a lot of feedback over the years saying that PGR students feel that um, their university experience isn't catered for them it's more for undergraduate students so what we find is that we're putting on groups and events for um, PGR students and particularly post-COVID making sure that we have those specific um Uh, activities and events for um, students who are saying we are really isolated and we want to be able to engage with with uh, with our peers. Brilliant thank you very much uh, everyone on that uh, particular subject I think we build on that a little bit now as we as we go on to um, your current initiatives Um, um, the the, the theme is is there on the slide but it'd be interesting to get your feedback on um, you know, what's resonating with your students now? Um, what have you implemented already? What's working? What's um, um, what's in the pipeline? Um, and if I can start with Kate on that one. Yeah, sure. I think this is really interesting. And I was interested in what Michael was saying um, earlier um, about kind of university events um, potentially being better than um, than student-led ones because sometimes we find the opposite um and and I think it I think it's a really interesting area to try and unpick um I think when we're talking about large events so things like welcome events um that, that everyone can come to and you're not having to students aren't having to disclose anything or put themselves into any um you know, to, to say, actually, I'm lonely and I want to meet people. It's, it's a, this is for everyone. There's a bit of an expectation of everyone um, to come to this. They seem to go really well. And we see um, some good starts of relationships there, particularly in our kind of international students for their, for their international welcome events. They seem to, to go really, really well when they're university led. There's some other things where if, if the university leads them, we don't seem to get as much uptake as, as we do when students lead them when they're a student union run event or a student society has put them on um so I think there's something quite interesting there but I do wonder whether the people that you get at the student-led ones are those who are already engaged and are already doing um doing well um and perhaps not feeling quite so lonely um 
we are doing quite a bit within our faculties at the minute, within our school, um, in our academic schools, which seem to be seem to be going really well. And I wonder if that's because there's they're a bit more co-created. So they're they're within the academic unit, um, but there's a lot of student input into those events. They're quite often the ones that our school-based wellbeing advisors lead um, and seem to get really, really good outcomes. I also just wanted to um, pick up the, the question before, and I know we've had some, some great practice shared already, um, but about neurodivergent students. So something that we do really successfully for um, some of our neurodivergent students is we do a transition event for them when they first come to university so they, they can get here earlier. So we give them an early introduction to campus um, and to services before main freshers week so before the campus gets really really busy um just so it feels a little bit more um manageable for them they obviously meet each other um and then we follow that up with a social group um that we we arrange um but again quite a lot of co-production in that um students will do will have pizza nights and games nights and go to escape rooms and things like that so it's a it's a regular thing um, and we've seen huge success from that and we've seen kind of real solid friendships um, build for that community. You know, we've seen people meet at those events and then go off traveling in the summer together and, and things like that. So that that is really, really good. So, again, if anyone ever wants to talk about that, more than happy um, because we've, we've had fabulous feedback from our uh, neurodivergent students about that. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, Jenny, can I come to you? Um, same question, really. Yeah, definitely. It, it definitely sort of fits on to what Kate was saying as well. So when in 2022, we really looked at how we could engage with our non-engaged members at the Students' Union. So we knew we had our societies, we knew we had our our sports clubs that will always turn up, but we had the, so many members that weren't engaging with us that probably were the ones that were lonely and needed to make those connections. Um, so we did two big changes from um, looking at a lot of data from our members from that. So the first one was that we started something called SU Makes. Um, I mentioned it earlier. Um, SU Makes really sort of started really simply with two aims, come along and make something and, and make connections and make a friend. Um, the majority of the students who come to these events are not the students who go to our nightclub and aren't the ones who go to our sports clubs or societies either. Um, and I'm really sure that we wouldn't have engaged with these students over the past two years without that. And that's really that safe space where people can make those connections, but are also doing something at the same time. So it's not so pressurized on that. So that's worked really well. We do an SU make round about every week now. We really mix it up so we can reach as many students as possible. And you can see that students are really gaining confidence in those and then the engagement's going sort of further across the SU as well. So that was a key initiative. And the second one as part of that was that welcome. We looked at how we can support students making connections at welcome rather than just putting events on. And um, so we did four big events. So we've done this two years now and um, where students come along with the main aim to help them meet others. And um, so and students know this. So we get really good feedback about these events and they actually thank us for socially engineering them to make friends but um, we have one event called squad games and um, which is pun on squid games students come and take tact take part of tasks so uh, we make them sort of move a ball from one side of the football pitch to the other with a group of people they've never met before and um, we do taste off which is a lot quieter but um, people are making friends over food as well so those two things combined have really sort of made us um, really made us really question on how can we reach those students that need us more than ever and um, but wouldn't come to the normal events or also aren't really engaging with the uni life they might go to the class they might not but how can we sort of engage them as well so definitely looking at how we can embed that even more and um, and as Michael mentioned earlier welcome and connections in general needs to be across the campus um partnership rather than just us doing that so we're still working on that cross-campus aspect of it and um, that's really a key uh, initiative that's also resonating with our students great thanks Jenny Emily can I come to you on that question please yeah thank you um I would say so in terms of the, the well-being service outside of our kind of core one-to-one -one work 
We also do group work and um, that's online and face to face. Um, and essentially the groups that we do, we um, really focus in on our hard to engage students. So, for example, we run um, a student parent group. We run um, a, a Chinese student group an all male um, or identify as male uh, group. We also run a neurodivergent lunchtime group. And what we we kind of over the last four years of us running the wellbeing service, we've really focused in on those particular areas of students that are hard to engage and really looked at what would be helpful to them. In terms of attendance, it's pretty sporadic I would say the most engaged group that we have is the neurodivergent lunch group and that's engaged really well and it, um, it's um, weekly one week it's face to face and one week it's online and then it alternates um, and there's the same kind of kind of core group of neurodivergent students that come along to that and then uh, new students come each week and essentially I think what works really well of that, with that is that sense of belonging that um, common experience and it's very much a relaxed environment and a space for neurodivergent students to talk about their experiences and as I say that's been engaged really well and um, in SEDI um, our community group work we do um, walks and pottery painting and there's um, our global campus does like a history walk um, which is really popular uh, walks in the Peak Districts we've had like 40 students attend that um, and also we do a peer mentoring project as well. So kind of students who are further along in their student experience, mentoring first year students, for example. And we also have a PGR equivalent of that where PGRs who are maybe in their second and third years, mentoring first years as well. And that works really well. That being, again, it's that kind of common um, common goal and common interest and that we find that that engages really well. In terms of the ones that don't get engaged very well, it's very sporadic in terms of what that need is at that time. So for example, the parent group was launched during the first year of the pandemic when we identified that student parents were really struggling with having children at home whilst they were trying to do their research when schools were closed, having a space to talk to the parents about how difficult that experience was. What we've found over time is that's been less engaged because maybe the need's not there as much. So we, I think, it, I think it's really important to um, to think about the different factors that influence engagement. Um, we we also know that um, in in wellbeing that mental health topics are really important to students. So we run our webinars and seminars for students who perhaps want some psychoeducation around a certain mental health condition or around a particular student issue. So for example, we might run a, um, a seminar on anxiety and how to manage anxiety. And that really helps connect students because when they come into the room and realize other students are feeling the same as them and they can go away with some information and also um, information, information about what we offer at, at, at the university overall in terms of services. Um, and I think it also can't hurt in terms of initiatives to just have things like putting on free food and drink and help kind of entice people to come in like we find students really like that. I think as well, just sort of on this point, I think we often in universities use the term student experience as like an overarching um, description. And I think sometimes it's not always a helpful term to use because I think that often when we do that we place students in a box and one of the things that's just so clear in our services is that every student has so many different needs and we've just obviously just been discussing that about how there might be students who engage really well with societies and um and can really engage with these activities that are put on by university so a student might be saying this is something that we really want but actually bridging that gap and allowing help them to get to those places is really difficult and there might be so many different factors which might be influencing that so for example I've had a student recently who is desperate to come to the neurodiverse lunch group but is extremely anxious about taking that first step so whether that means me 
going with that student for that first um, initial group session or even just walking them to the door or something just about going above and beyond really to be able to just make sure that that student feels like that they're supported. Uh, there might be financial, cultural, mental health presentations that are stopping a student from having their student experience. And um, I think it's just really important to um, for, for, to remember that there's so many different components as to why students engage with our initiatives or don't. Um, so just a, sorry. No, <laughs> I was just gonna say a final thing that just popped into my head, just because you were saying about um, inviting neurodivergent students as well to um, a, a week earlier, that's something that we do during Freshers Week. So we have orientation week where we invite students to come to the campus before it kind of gets really busy. And so that's open to maybe international students who are feeling quite nervous about being around campus, neurodivergent students, students with um, uh, mental health presentations that maybe just don't want to have that busyness. And we do like an IKEA trip for students that maybe don't need like basic utensils and maybe don't have the financial support from family to be able to get things. And so we have a bit of funding for that as well. Thanks, Emily. Uh, finally, Misha on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as part of, of my remit it is to look at events and, and initiatives on campus to, to you know provide students with the opportunity to make friends or, or build new skills or create new communities so I think we've, we've touched on that quite quite a bit but as Kate said we definitely find at Kent that if they're peer-led they're better engaged with um, than, than if they're university-led and I think part of Kent's problem in the past has maybe been a lack of coordination of initiative and events so everyone has the best intention for our students we all want them to engage we all want them to um you know build those communities and, and have the best experience whilst they're at university but there hasn't been that coordination and people have done things in silos and i think that um that's created almost too much choice and if a student is struggling to kind of dip their toe into finding their people or or you know building social skills having a huge calendar of events all on the same day, sometimes targeted at the same kind of um, uh, kind of session or, or skill set is really daunting and, and it disengages students. So um, some of the initiatives that, that we've done, particularly this year, but it's been ongoing for a couple of years, is looking at um, coordination. So uh, we have two subgroups of, a, of a, an experience committee that I chair that is solely looking at what events are we putting on for students? What are the aims of, of those events? What are the initiatives? Where can we link up and where can we join forces and provide that nice streamlined service for students? And where do we need those specialisms or those, those um, events and initiatives targeted at particular groups? Because we know there's a need or we know that they're particularly disengaged and getting the specialist teams and also students where possible in to actually uh, help build those um, and, and kind of having that coordinated approach behind the scenes, which sometimes can be a bit chaotic, but then providing that nice team blind um, offer to students so that they can find their space. Um, and then obviously having the support services there that, that can um, fill any gaps or, or kind of help with any barriers to, to students actually accessing those initiatives or those events or those, those services. Um, one of the key things that has come in at Kent um, in the last two years is a service called Nexus. Uh, and we describe Nexus as our campus help point. Uh, and it was in response to Again, students that didn't know where to turn, and it can be literally for anything. It could be for more academic support. It can be for um, uh, kind of more student support or, or well-being. But it can also just be for that. I don't know what's happening at Kent. Um, I don't know where to turn. You know, can you help me? And that is staffed by both substantive staff and student staff. So it, it really has that nice appeal to students, um, and it's been really successful. And I think it's it's probably helped with our building of that that uh, sense of community and that belonging um, over the last couple of years. And we're, we're planning on expanding that because it, it has been a real success. Great, thanks Misha. Um, in the interest of time, uh, for all of all of the best possible reasons where we're kind of running over time and we had a couple of areas left to cover, uh, the panelists fortunately know what those two areas are. So, um, and we also have some questions starting to come in. So I'm keen to get a little bit of time um, to, to answer those if we can. So the last um, two areas that we were going to cover um, were um, technology is only contributing to social isolation. What are your thoughts and comments? Um, and secondly, a look to the future. 
um, what do you think, uh, what, what does the future hold for, hold for you, your students and your university? I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to, to pick, pick that subject, one of those subjects or both of those subjects and answer in a minute, if you can, um, anything you particularly want to get across in that so that we can get onto, onto some questions. And I'm gonna start with uh, Misha. Thank you. So I think I'll look at the future because um, Kent is undergoing our next five year strategy and uh, we're really looking at literally everything that we offer as a university. And one of those is the, the big heading of student experience. So for us, um, it's it's more about the student co-creation. So as I said, anything that's kind of peer led seems to be better at Kent. We want our students to tell us what they want out of their experience. Um, and we want as many students as possible to, to tell us that so we can cater for them and kind of tailor that, that experience that's available to them. Um, we're also trying to put in mechanisms to give us more data. So data has always been a weak point at Kent um, and without student voice and data, it's really difficult. You're almost kind of a finger in the air. This is what we think we should do and see if it works. And that can waste a lot of time and a lot of money. So we're trying to be uh, more efficient and more kind of data led um, with our with our initiatives um, and like I've said uh, we we're looking at that coordination of events and, and initiatives on campus and, and kind of that cross-institutional working so that we can provide a streamlined offer to students but they can also fit in with their their increasingly difficult um, you know lives whether we're balancing work or caring or, or, or study um, and then looking at the kind of more academic um, mechanisms to, to help that. So things like block timetabling and trying to um, get students in on those particular days. If they do have other responsibilities, they can engage with those easier um, or they can engage more on campus with social events and, and kind of that extracurricular offer. Thanks, Misha. Um, Emily. Hi. Uh, well, to be different, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer the, the technology is social isolation. Um, I think, to be on the fence about this, I think there's two sides to this. Um, I think on one hand, it perhaps allows students to hide behind a screen. I know that particularly during COVID, lecturers were feeding back to us when we were on faculty level um, about the fact that students weren't having, they believe students weren't having the same experience, learning experience because when they arrived at lectures, uh, majority of students had their screens off and the mutes off and all this kind of thing um, and that that was affecting um, experience so I think there's a, a potential for isolation in that sense but obviously we've moved on since that and students are now on campus um, but I think on the other hand I think what's really great about technology is it allows our students to connect with the world at the click of a button to find information more freely um, like apps like Viewme are allowing students to kind of dip their toes into connection. And I think what's really, what I found really, what I guess I've kept myself during my experience working with Viewme is how we, how we measure a positive outcome when it comes to connection and um, whether students are feeling socially isolated or not. So, for example, if a positive outcome might be seen as a student meeting somebody in person, for other students, maybe a positive outcome is just downloading the app or it might be just messaging and they might not feel OK about meeting somebody in person at first. And, and I think it's just really important to be open minded about what we see a positive outcome as, because I know for some of the students that I see, it's huge for them to even book an appointment with me to make that. Uh, initial connection or it might be huge for them to be able to be open to just downloading that app and um, so I think I would say that in lots of ways having those options there that technology and that op those options there are, are brilliant for students to feel connected um, but we just need to look at how we measure that really. Thanks Emily. Uh, Jenny impossible task in a minute? Yep yeah, same slide we'll stick to technology and um, I, yeah, I think I think it's really important. I completely agree with Emily. I think we should really see technology as part of the journey and sort of the stepping stone, especially when we're sort of looking at you, me and looking at the first stages of students trying to make those connections. And um, I got my survey data back over the past few weeks and I was reading through the statements from students. And one student really just said I was lonely for a few days, joined you, me, found a friend and now they're my flatmate. 
or there was more stories oh I was lonely for a few weeks but then I joined Yumi and then so it's very much sort of that stepping stone to be able to really I think and that's the thing for anyone but especially if you're struggling with confidence or you don't know where to go I think we really should ensure that we really utilize technology and um, a new thing that our student leaders embedded in this year were um, peer support groups I know they've been done years over decades we've tried to do peer support groups at universities and students unions and um, but they ran them and they ran them on whatsapp groups with volunteers and um, and they really worked students felt safe to be able to share their concerns with other peers on whatsapp groups and those groups really then sort of became their own communities and we started doing events for them so specifically for the peer uh, the peer groups in January when they were coming to start in January they had their welcome event specifically for them so technology I think is a good thing if you sort of embed it into the real life aspect as well. Thanks Jenny. Kate. Well I've got to go future haven't I because then it evens it up so um and I think with, without ending on on something negative, I'll, I'll go with the challenges that we anticipate. And I think um, it's important that we, again, going back to Michael's presentation right at the beginning, that we understand that actually we haven't stopped seeing the impacts of COVID and that is going to keep coming through our student population because, you know, all the the children during COVID who missed out on those things, on that kind of level of social interaction, who missed out on the teaching, uh, are still going to be coming through with, with that impact. And I'm not sure we quite know what it's going to look like. So it's definitely a challenge for us to be aware of and for us to think about. And I think what we found during COVID is that the people most impacted were the people who were already more vulnerable. And so what we have the potential to see is that greater disparity between experience and that will be more work for, for us to do to think about how we close that gap. You know, we're, we're talking a lot always about closing gaps in student experience and um, you know what students can, can access and achieve at university. And I think that focus is still gonna be very, very much there for universities. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, very conscious of, of, of time and the need for a, 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 a 10 o'clock, a 10 a.m. UK time finish. Um, I think we'll, 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 we, we've got one question specifically for Kate, uh, which was, please, can you say how you promote, um, how you promote and market the neurodivergent social group without making students feel othered? I think probably a really key bit for that is that it often gets first raised at our um, transition event and often by students that have been using the group. So there's that kind of, there's that peer experience and peer um, element to it that I think is really important. I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll say that much and Patsy, feel free to get in touch if you want to talk about it more. Thank you. There's another couple of, of, of comments in the Q&A, which we'll take we'll, we'll take offline and share after the event because we we will run out of time, uh, I think. Um, I, I really want to take the time to thank um, our panelists, uh, Kate, Jenny, Misha and Emily for, for such a fantastic job. I think we could have gone on for another hour quite easily. I'd also like to thank Michael um, for his excellent uh, keynote earlier. This is going to be this is the first in in hopefully a long series of, of um, webinars from Yumi. So I'd ask everybody to keep an eye out um, for future invites. Uh, Lucy has popped a, 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 a survey question. It'll only take you thirty seconds. If if you're on the call and you wouldn't mind uh, by helping us um, inform what we do in future and, and and how we go forward. If there's anything you'd like to know further about um, Yumi, then um, we have um, we, the Yumi team will be staying on the call for the next five or ten minutes afterwards. Um, um, I just noticed uh, Laura Evans popped her hand up there. Laura, is there anything you particularly wanted to add? If you did, you can unmute yourself. It might have been an inadvertent hands up. Um, but it remains to, to just say, I hope you've all found this uh, of, of interest, that you've picked up something that will help you and your institution uh, going forward uh, in dealing with this incredibly important 
uh, issue of, of student loneliness and isolation. Um, thanks to everyone who attended, everybody who contributed. contributed. Um, uh, thank you uh, to the UMI team for putting this on so successfully without any real uh, hiccups. Um, I'm both delighted and slightly surprised that we managed to get through the hour and a half intact. Um, but um, thank you, everyone. It's been uh, it's been great to have you on the on the webinar, and uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.